Good morning. It is good to be with you. I understand and I hear and I share somewhat Donald's statement about how fun it is to be outside. Yeah, I, it's kind of got moments of funness, but it'd be better if we were not between trees, but that's fine. She'll have the best view of the, the show. Um, there's a lot going on. If we just stood by a sea and I could bark real loud, I guess it got a little easier, but uh, it is good to be with you again. So wonderful to see you. Such an encouragement. Last week was, uh, I, I shouldn't say surprise, but uh, we had no idea what we would have. And, uh, you know, 126 was way more than we were thinking. It was so wonderful to have you here. And I got to remember, you folks are there too, because I can't see you as well. Hello, Brent. <laughs> so I'll have to remember. Brethren, the scripture reading for this morning is Isaiah chapter 58, verses 1 through 9. Isaiah 58, 1 through 9. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh, then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. Israel was struggling. They were being attacked by foreign nations and they were losing. And the complaint to Israel is, hey, we've been fasting. What's the deal? How come you're not taking care of us? You see, what Israel had misunderstood, had come to misunderstand, is the same thing we can misunderstand. That the sacrifices and commands of God are somehow things that we do that benefit or profit God. They were saying, hey, we did that thing for you. You owe us. And that attitude can get inside of us. And look at the result. God says, I'm not listening to you. And the reason I'm not listening to you is because you're fasting in a way that's easy for you and you're doing it as a payment to me. When what was the purpose of fasting, brethren? You understand that God seeing his people hungry doesn't make him like happy or better. You understand that doesn't do anything for him if we don't have a meal. Fasting was given to Israel as a means of helping them to atone for their sins and to help them not sin in the future. Look at verse 5. Is it a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul. See, that was what the purpose of fasting was. It was to be a trying time to remind them of the reason I'm fasting is because I've sinned. I've messed up again. And I don't want to do it anymore. And I'm sorry, God. But they were treating it as, God, I fasted. Give me your blessings. Thus our title for this morning. 
bless me, God, or else. Because we can think that way with not just fasting, but all of our service to God. We can think religion is about things we do and things we don't do instead of being what religion is really about, who we are. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to begin by talking about this common misunderstanding. Why? Because it's common and it's easy, easy even for us to fall into that trap. Okay? The first thing we have to understand, and maybe we don't like that, she's walking. That's not right. She was a little baby last time. Um, God doesn't need anything. Hopefully this doesn't surprise you too much. God doesn't even need our existence. Genesis 1 and verse 26, what does it say? Then God said, let us. What's that word us, brethren? It's plural. God didn't need to create man so that he would have company. Okay? There was company already. God doesn't need us to exist so that he'll have someone to love. There were already, already the hosts in heaven. And in John 17, Jesus said, Father, love them as you loved me before the foundation of the earth. Love already was. Love is God's nature, 1 John 4 and verse 8. And the only reason we love, 1 John 4 19, is because he loved us first. We need to understand that our existence is not something God needed. It's something God wanted for love, but he didn't need it. It doesn't do him a favor, do you understand? He lacks nothing. Turn in your Bibles to the 50th Psalm, and we'll drive home this point, Lord willing. Look at verse seven. Psalm 50, verse 7. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Boy, does that world today that we live in need to hear that. I am God, your God. I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats out of your folds. Why? Why won't you accept our sacrifices? Because every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all its fullness. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Just like with fasting, Israel was thinking that their sacrifices of bulls and rams, that somehow that was feeding God. It was giving something to God. Now, we understand that in the pagan world, there is that concept that the sacrifices of animals is somehow feeding their God with the lives of the animals they're taking. But that's not God. As God said, everything's mine. What are you going to give me? I brought you this ram. I created that ram. <laughs> it's mine. Oh, Father, I brought you this bull. I created that bull. All the bulls are mine. See, then here's the misunderstanding. Well, then why am I giving you these things? And why do you say you're pleased with the aroma from the burnt offering? The answer is, again, what was the purpose of sacrifice, brethren? It was to atone for sin, to allow for the forgiveness of sin, and to encourage them to sin no longer. Why? Because then they could be with God. That's what God wants. That's why he gave them the sacrificial system. That's why he gave us Jesus, our sacrifice, so that we could be together. Because God is holy and he cannot be with sin. They thought they were buying God. They thought they were giving him things, and thus he would owe them protection. That's why in Isaiah, the first chapter, he says, I wish you would stop worshiping me. Stop bringing all your sacrifices, because you're not doing it from your heart. 
You think you can buy me off and I don't need anything from you. The sacrifices are for you, not for me. What does God get out of it? We'll talk more of that later. It's like we read in Micah chapter 6, 6 through 8. A common lament. Listen to the attitude in the people of Israel as they address their God. With what shall I approach the Lord and bow down myself before high God? Shall I bring to the Lord burnt offerings, calves a year old? Shall I, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my trespass, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? What are they saying, church? All right, God, you're not helping us. What's it going to cost us? What do you want? You want a couple goats? You want some uh, oil, more oil? What's it going to take for you to do what we want you to do? That's the attitude. And that attitude can get into anyone who tries to worship God if they're not careful. What was God's response to that? He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To do justly, to love mercy, and mark it, to walk humbly with your God. That's what he wants. That's why in Hosea 6, in verse 6, we have that, that statement that Jesus quoted twice in Matthew 9, 13 and Matthew 12, 7. God does not desire sacrifices or burnt offerings. What does he require? Loving faithfulness. God doesn't want us to do sacrifices. Sacrifices are for us because we sin. What God wants is that we not sin. But he provided those sacrifices and all those commands as a means for us to overcome our sin. Do you understand that? Because so many times people misunderstand it. And they think religion is about things that you do and things that you don't do. That's why Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, said those haunting words. He said, there are going to be people that are going to come to me on the judgment day. A lot of people. And you know what they're going to be saying? Wait a minute. I'm on the wrong side of judgment here. Lord, didn't I call you Lord? Lord, didn't I do many things in your name? See, they were saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. I called myself a Christian. So I should be saved. That doesn't make you a Christian. Lord, I did many things that you wanted me to do as a Christian. Well, I appreciate that, but that wasn't the deal. What does Jesus say to those people? He says, depart from me. I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. Notice, it's not about things we do or don't do. What is it? It's about who we are. That's why Jesus didn't say to those people, you didn't do enough. What did he say? I don't know who you are. I don't recognize you. That's the trap we can fall into. We don't want to hear those words, church. We can think that religion, Christianity, is about doing good deeds and not doing wicked deeds. That's not what it's about. It's entailed but it's not what it's about. What it's about is becoming Christ-like, becoming a Christian. And then what happens naturally when you become a Christian? You do good things, and you don't do wicked things. It may seem like there's not much difference there, but brethren, it's all the difference in the world. We Christians, we're zealous for good works. Why? That we might earn salvation? No, of course not. Then why are we zealous for good works? Because we've been saved. See the difference? It's a huge difference attitudinally. And if that's not a word, it should be. And it sounds like an impressive one, doesn't it? Attitudinally. That's the common misunderstanding. Let's talk about the facts of the matter. The facts of the matter is found in Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2. Very similar to Micah 6, 6 through 8. They were contemporary prophets. But in Isaiah 66, verse 1, this is what the Lord says to Israel. 
He says, heaven is my throne. The earth, it's my footstool. Where would you build me a house? David, you got any room in your backyard that uh, God could throw up a shack maybe? He needs a place to stay. No. God says, the earth is my footstool. Where are you going to build me a house? And then he follows it up by saying, and every place you think that you could have for me and everything you say you could give to me, I created it. The only reason it exists is because I made it. So his point is, understand our relationship. And look at verse 2, because that's what it's all about. It's not about doing things, giving things. What's it about? He says, this is the one who I will look upon. This is the one I will dwell with. He who has a humble and contrite heart. And he who trembles at my word. You see the point? It's very similar to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. What God wants, the facts of the matter is he wants to be with us. And for us to be able to be with him, we have to allow him to be God and we to be his people. We are to be like him. We are to transform ourselves into his likeness so that we can be together. That's why 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16, gird up the loins of your mind. You know these things, Peter says. Now manfully pursue them, or womanly pursue them, whatever you do, just pursue it with all that you got. And what is that? As obedient children. Well, we're God's children. Parents, what do you want from your children? Do you want them to sacrifice the things that you gave them to you? Of course not. What do you want? You want to be with them. You want to love them, and you want them to love you. That's what you want. Therefore, as obedient children, he says, be holy. Why? Because God is holy. That's what he wants. And all the sacrifices, <coughs> there's so many mics. <coughs> all the sacrifices, all the commandments, all the light we are to walk in is to help us overcome our sin problem so that we can be with him. Right? 1 John 1, 5 through 10, explained in this way. Um, God is light. In him is no darkness. So if you have any darkness in you, do you understand that you cannot be with God? And that's not what he wants. He wants to be with you. So what? Well, verse 7, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, if you are faithful and access the grace of God, then you are continually washed by the blood of his son, the sacrifice that he gave, that we might be free from sin and might be able to be with him. Justified, right? Just as if I'd never sinned. Then we can be together. And he even says, and if you stumble along the way, God is faithful. If you'll confess it, he'll forgive you your sins. Why? 1 John 2 and 2, because Jesus Christ is the propitiation of our sins. Every time, that's the answer, brethren. What God wants is us to be together. And the only way we can be together is if we are that new creation, that Christ-like individual. All the sacrifices, all the do's and don'ts of Christianity are not about earning salvation they're about the natural expression of who we are in Christ. And if you'd all just nod a little bit, it'll make me feel a little bit better. Thank you. Yes, right? Am I right? I'm right. Consider the Sermon on the Mount. How did Jesus start the Sermon on the Mount? The Beatitudes, right? You see, that's who you have to be. That's why it starts there. This is who you have to be in order to be a member of the kingdom of heaven. What follows? Here are the natural expressions of who you are. Watch out for hypocrisy, right? How does it end? Watch out for false teachers who are going to try to deceive you, who are going to say, yeah, being uh, meek and uh, loving mercy, that's one thing, but if you mail me in a check for $29.99, I'll send you this holy anointing oil and y'all will be saved. That's not it. Watch out for false teachers. You be who you're supposed to be and walk as you would walk. Matthew chapter 7, 15 through 20. 
Jesus gives the perfect illustration of this whole sermon. That's why he's the master teacher and I'm just me. He said, good trees bear good fruit. A bad tree cannot bear good fruit. So there he goes into horticulture again. I don't know why he spends so much time talking about uh, the crops. Do you see what he said? If you don't, let me change one word. Let's change the word good to God. God trees bear God fruit. Ungodly trees cannot bear God fruit, no matter how many good things they try to do. No matter how many wicked things they don't do. Because it's not about what you do or what you don't do. It's about who you are. Right? So what am I saying? Am I saying there's nothing Christians are supposed to be doing? God forbid, brethren. Am I saying there's nothing that Christians are not supposed to do? God forbid, brethren. To become a Christian, there are things you have to do, aren't there? What am I saying? I'm saying is you can't put the cart in front of the horse. You can't try to produce good fruit if you're not a good tree. Because no matter how many good things you do, unless you're Christ, unless you're justice and merciful and walking humbly with God, it doesn't matter what you do. Because you're not even in the equation. Right? What if I, brethren, we know our Bible, what if I am the greatest person in the world? I am Mother Teresa times two on steroids. Okay? But I've never been baptized for the remission of sin. Brethren, am I going to go to heaven? I'm assuming everybody's shaking their head no. Why not? I'm the goodest person that's ever been, save our Lord. Because it's not about that. It's about becoming someone. John chapter 3 and verse 5, what did our Lord say? No one will see the kingdom of heaven unless he is born again of spirit and water. What did Paul write in 2 Corinthians 5, 17? Anyone in Christ? He is a new creation. All things have become new. That's what Christianity is about. And there are things we have to do along the way, but it all comes from who we are. Notice in the five-finger plan of salvation, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Notice repent comes before baptism. You've got to change your mind, who you are, before you obey and become that new creature. Do you see it, church? Why do I say this? Why do I harp on it, small harp? Because so many people think Christianity is doing and not doing. Instead of understanding that Christianity is about transformation, conforming to the image of Christ, and then everything that you do naturally follows. It's easy to do checklists. I've often used this illustration. I can send flowers to my wife every single day. I can send her a card every single day. I can write her 180 line sonnets, if that's possible, I'm not a poet extra, um, telling her about all I love her. I can do all those things, brethren, and I cannot love my wife, can't I? I'm just doing things. I'm just going through the motions. It's about who we are and the natural expression. So watch out for that. Keep Christ in your sights, always looking unto him because he showed us who we must be. Romans 8, 29, I harp on it a lot. Why? Because it says those who are going to be saved were foreordained from the beginning. Only those who are conformed to the image of Christ. Not some list of things to do. Not some list of things not to do. Be who God would have you to be, who he created you to be, and you'll naturally do the things you ought and naturally not do the things you're not. It's there, but it's a, a stumbling block for so many. Forewarned is forearmed. Yes, brethren? If you're not a Christian this morning, and you're not the person you need to be. It means you're in your sin. And since you're in your sin, you're separated from God. And that is not what God wants. He wants to be together. He sent his son into the world 
to suffer and die that you might be washed of your sins so that you could be together. Why not take him up on his offer? If you understand what's required of you, as was said in Micah chapter 6, then come forward. Let's take care of this right now. If you're watching and you're at home or you're far away, contact one of us so we may reach out to you and take care of the situation. It is too important to God not to be important to you. And Christians, if you've been marking checklists and doing and don'ting instead of becoming and living, stop. Turn back. God wants all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength completely devoted to him. That's a new creature. Then everything else will follow. If you haven't been doing that, turn back. If there's anything we can do to help you, please come forward. Contact us as together we now stand and sing.